And good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Two Guys in a Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. You can uh, kind of see my different background and different situation here. I won't go into a lot of that, but trying out some different things, seeing as how I'm losing my regular studio uh, where I've been since 2006, I might add. All of a sudden, we've got to get out. We've got until May the 17th uh, to vacate. Not a happy time, but <laughs> it, is, it is what it is. So anyway, I'm filming from my house and going to be playing a, around a little bit with setting up uh, a little bit of a studio here at the house. I'm going, I've got about three or four different venues here at the house that I'm going to be trying out, you know, to see which one is going to be uh, the most effective. The, this was almost a last minute type of thing. I'm going, well, I've actually filmed YouTube videos sitting here like this before. I don't like the glare in the back, obviously, uh, but my wife forbade putting up a curtain. So there's that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, welcome back to Two Guys in the Bible here on Fulfilled Radio. My name is Don K. Preston, and that is Daniel Rogers. Daniel, how you doing this evening? Oh, doing pretty good. Pretty good, Don. We had a, a lock-in at church uh, this last Friday night, so I stayed up all night long, 7 wow. to 7. That was what we did, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. <laughs> and wow. I told the parents, 7 a.m., not 701, <laughs> not 702. 7 they will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm leaving. I'm, gone. I'm out of there. Um, and I made a challenge to them that if they could bring 15 visitors, then I'd let them dye my hair blue. Oh. They didn't do it. So I reissued a different challenge and said, okay, it won't be as a dr drastic of a change. But if you all can memorize all 27 books of the New Testament, you know, uh, then I'll go ahead and do it. And so they worked hard. A lot of them had done that since childhood, but they had a lot of people that had never grown up going to Sunday school uh, and things like that. And good. so they worked really hard at it and got it. And you can't tell because my hair is so dark, but there is kind of a blue tint to it. It looks different than it did last week compared to the two, and you'll see in the sunlight, yeah. it shows up blue. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to do it. I have to do it two weeks. I've got to preach in it once, and then I can make it go back brown. So. There you go. There we go. There, yeah, <laughs> uh, kids seem to love that kind of a challenge. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Make let's make the preacher's hair blue. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, of course, uh, I have I have to come back, and I have yeah. to say, uh, uh, my Razorbacks could not get it done, but I'm not too horribly upset because Duke is Duke. Um, they are on Shashevsky's, you know, farewell tour. And let's face it, I mean, Arkansas overachieved this year. Nobody expected them hmm. uh, to be in the elite, elite eight. And uh, the, the reality uh, is that the players that Arkansas has had on their team this year, uh, only one or two of them were, quote, um, uh, McDonald's All-American. Just they, they were really, really good players. And Eric Musselman coached them up. But when you look at uh, Duke, three of their starting players were ranked within the top 10 mm. of the national recruits. The other two were, were within the top 25. Yeah. And so you, you are talking the elite of the elite uh, basketball players that Arkansas was playing against. And there were periods of time in the game that you go, wow, they are really, really playing well, yeah. but Duke just, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. Uh, as I've told several people, got to face it. Duke just had the better team. That's all there was to it. There's no shame in losing to a better team. I'm extremely proud of the way my Razorbacks played this year. For sure. Uh, you know, nobody can, can complain about being in the Elite Eight for two years in a row. No, not at all. Not at all. And St. Peter, huh? Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. I think they ran out of gas. Now, needless to say, they ran against the North, North Carolina team. Yeah. They're not quite as talented as Duke, but nonetheless, they are just loaded yeah. with talent. They're, they're perennial uh, champions and what have you. So, uh, yeah, hats off to the, I think, what to call the Peacocks? Oh, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Peacocks of St. Yeah. Peter's. <laughs> that doesn't really conjure up a fighting. <laughs> Yeah, not like a Razorback or, you know, or a Tiger <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. So uh, anyway, yeah, hats, hats off to them. I tell you, this this has really been an exciting uh, March Madness. Hmm. 
And uh, the championship game, no matter who's in the actual championship game, uh, it, this is going to be an epic battle. Oh, yeah. Real, really is. And uh, I'm, I'm really a football fan, to be honest about it, uh, college football. Uh, and I was extremely proud of the way my Razorbacks came, came back this last year. Uh, but, boy, when it comes down to basketball and the way they've been playing for the last two, three years, uh, really got me cranked up. Yeah, love it. Love it. Oh, yeah, basketball is exciting. Actually, I actually prefer basketball to football. But, you know, you watch you watch your team regardless of what they're doing. So, <laughs> Well, uh, I'm, I'm one of these, don't ask me to watch golf, okay? Oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I would, <laughs> I would rather watch grass grow <laughs> than watch somebody play golf. And yeah. I know there, uh, don't misunderstand me, there's a lot of skill involved in that. I've played golf four times in my life and I laid the, I laid the clubs down and said, okay, I don't need that frustration. Right. I got plenty, I got plenty of frustration in my life without well, that. Well, that's why they call it a stroke. Cause every time you miss, you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> you know? <That's> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and for the most part, I'm not a, I'm not a baseball fan, but occasionally I do get caught up. I've been watching the ladies uh, uh, softball team, some from OU. Mm. They have a, they have an absolutely awesome team. Uh, they have a gal on their team that has hit over 100 home runs. Wow. They have been, <clears throat> they have been run scoring. Uh, I mean, by that, I mean the game called in the fifth inning over their last 10 games, probably six or seven times. Wow. Come the fifth inning, they're ahead like 14 to nothing, 14 to one, whatever. And it's like, call the game. Yeah. Yeah. They, well, the, they're, uh, Texas and Texas Tech, I think, they had some exciting uh, game endings the other day because they had uh, one guy who stole home to win the game in overtime oh, in the 10th oh, inning. Oh, wow. Oh, and then, wow. and then the same dude comes back the next day and hits a walk off grand slam in the tenth <laughs> inning again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so. ob obviously that's some pretty exciting stuff. Oh yeah. But you know, but, I I, pl I played I try I should say I tried to play baseball in high school, hmm. and uh, that was never going to work out. Well, for me, once it if you have to have hundreds of games played to get a few highlights. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, well, I determined real quickly, like I said, that I was never going to play baseball. Uh, I was always fast. I could run the bases. But when it came to facing these guys that could stand on the mound, mm -hmm. and in high school, we, we had a pitcher on our team that stood six foot four. He was about that big around, but nonetheless yeah. – <laughs> He, he could throw a 92 mile an hour fastball. Wow. That's moving. And, and, and in yeah. high school, that's incredible. And he could throw the most wicked curveball. And I'll never forget on one occasion, this is when I decided baseball was not for, for me, really. <laughs> right. Uh, he got a bunch of us out there and he says, Hey guys, I need to throw some practice. And I noticed none of my buddies who are far better players than me, none of them wanted to get in the batting box. I go, what's the deal here? You know, because I'd never, I'd never stood in the batting box with him. And uh, finally, I said, "Come on, Preston, come on, stand there." And he said, "Okay, now, if I yell, you bail out. <laughs> but if I don't yell, just stand in there and hit the ball." I'm going. What does that what? mean? <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> I'm standing there, you know, trimmering, and, <laughs> and he throws the ball, and he does not yell, but that ball was headed right here. Oh, wow. And, I mean, it goes in for a strike, and I was like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Not at 92 miles an hour. I don't care if I got a helmet on or not. No. I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's something. Yeah. <laughs> it really was. And uh, the University of Arkansas actually recruited him for a little bit. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, he never played, but uh, oh, no. but they they nonetheless recruited him for just a little bit because he couldn't control. He didn't have enough control. Uh, when he was on, he was pretty good, but he, he wasn't on all that terribly much. Now, I, I figured something out. I figured it out. So it's, a, it's an aha moment. So you like football and base, basketball, sports where people are moving around, constant stuff is going on, golf, baseball, kind of boring. Now, I think you and I have both been accused of talking too fast. <laughs> <laughs> And so I wonder if there's any correlation between the two. Between the two. Yeah, there could be. Yeah, there very well so. could be. And false, yeah. false, false accusations. But that's that's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, no. yeah. Neither one of us talk too fast. No, no uh, not, so. not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Well, listen. Thank you again for being with us here on Two Guys in the Bible on Fulfilled Radio. Okay. As promised last week, and, and last week, uh, Daniel and I actually covered a lot of material hmm. when we were talking about the Messianic Temple in John chapter 14. <clears throat> Pardon me. And we, we went through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 a little bit. And the reason we did so is we kept pointing out that John chapter 14 is not, as so many people believe, it's not about Christ coming to take the church off of the earth. It is about Christ restoring the fellowship between heaven and earth. And we brought 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 into the discussion. Now, I want to give a little bit of a backstory here, Daniel. <clears throat> Pardon me. Years and years ago, William and I were discussing 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, mind you, this is before I ever published my book, we shall meet him in the air is before I ever even did the research on the book. But William and I were on the phone and I kept telling him, I said, you know, William, I'm betting that there's a key to understanding first Thessalonians chapter four in a far better way than simply pointing out, Oh, look, it says we who are alive and remain right. until the coming of the Lord. And he said, well, go to work on it. And I said, well, I, I intend to, <clears throat> but I said, I suspect that there's something so simple, so easy, and so powerful that once one of us discovers it, us being preterist, right. that it's, it's really going to just lift the veil. Pardon me. Well, one day, <clears throat> as I was reading some commentary, this commentary referenced an article by a scholar by the name of Plevnik, P-L-E-V-N-I-K. And I believe the year was 1952. I may be wrong on that. Uh, it's been a while. But Plevnik wrote one of the most significant, the most impactful, the most influential articles on the little Greek word apontesis. Now, apontesis is translated meat. When Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 14, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <laughs> <clears throat> we shall meet him in the air. And again, that's translated from the Greek word apontesis. And this commentator that I was reading cited Plevnik, who is taking note of the fact that in the first century, actually a couple of centuries prior to the first century, that apontesis was a, quote, technical term. Now, a technical term, ladies and gentlemen, is a term or a word that has a given normal definition of a certain thing, and it, and it hardly ever deviates from that, and that so that when you see that term, you have this mental image that comes to your mind. This word picture comes to your mind. And the word image, according to Plevnik, is that apontesis was used of a royal dignitary who is traveling to a given destination. And the people of that destination, the people of that city, would see them coming the dignitaries within the city 
would go out to meet him, join with his entourage, and bring him, escort him back into the city, which was his destination. In other words, the city was the destination. The entourage, the, the visiting dignitary, wasn't coming to get the people out of the city and take them out of the city. He was coming to visit the city. And <clears throat> another factor was that as the inhabitants of the city came out to meet him, they were subsumed into or assimilated into, if you please, his entourage. So they became a part of his entourage as they are all going into the city. And I read that and the proverbial atom bomb went off in my head. And I was like, this is the key. This is what William and I were saying. One of these days, somebody's going to discover the key. I began to just, I, I began, began buying at the time about every commentary on Thessalonians I could get my hands on. And so that got rather expensive. So, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> some of the commentaries I bought cost me over $140. So, yeah, oh, it, wow. yeah. yeah, these are some of those really expensive scholarly works. And so what I did was I went up to Oklahoma City, Edmonds specifically, to what used to be OCC, Oklahoma Christian College. They changed the name for a while. Now they just call it OC. But I went to the library. And I asked the librarian, I said, I want, I want you to point me to your section on the commentaries on Thessalonians. And what was interesting, Daniel, <clears throat> I was rather taken back by it. I'm, I'm in this section reading comments. And I would gather, and I asked her if I could, I would gather up six or seven, eight or 10 commentaries, go to a table, and I would start writing down the quotes. And this librarian came over <clears throat> and she said, let me make a recommendation of another book, another commentary, another reference. And I said, well, thank you very much. She said, and she leaned down and she said, I know who you are. <laughs> I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I go, really? <laughs> yeah, how did, how did she know? Have no earthly idea. Oh. Had no earthly idea how she knew who I was or even what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm obviously doing research. Right. And I, I don't assume, I cannot assume that she knew I was researching to write a book on Thessalonians, let's face it. Or uh, Apontesis, you know. <laughs> uh, or Apontesis yeah. specifically. But I mean, I looked up at her like, really? And she said, yeah, I know who you are and I know what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And she said, if there's anything at all that I can do to help, she said, you come and get me and I'll help you. <laughs> Well, there you secret, go. Yeah, secret preterist there. <laughs> yeah. <wow. laughs> and <clears throat> I I was literally stunned. Daniel, as I went through the commentaries to read how some of the world's finest Greek scholars acknowledged and acknowledge this technical definition. Of apontesis. Now, let me let me add to it. Not only is the word apontesis itself a borderline technical term, and I'm what I mean by borderline is there are instances in which the term, uh, uh, the word itself, apontesis, can be used in a simple sense, in a non-technical sense of, hey, I'm going to meet Joe Blow down at the coffee shop. We're going to have a cup of coffee. That doesn't mean I'm going to bring you back to my house. Okay. So apontesis in a non-technical uh, context can simply mean you're going to meet somebody, and it's used that way uh, in the Septuagint uh, in several instances. However, when apontesis is used with the Greek word parousia, it is invariably 
a technical usage because apontesis is fundamentally a technical term. Parousia is borderline technical. Wayne Jackson of the Churches of Christ, he passed away a few, few years ago now. Uh, Wayne Jackson used to write, and in his writings, he always said, parousia is a technical term for Christ's second coming. That was Wayne Jackson's view. Well, the word parousia can be used in a non-technical sense, and, te and context determines that. However, when you have apontesis and parousia used together, and I will, I will take it one step further. As many, many commentators note, when you have apontesis used in a context of a royal visit by a dignitary, it is absolutely, invariably, a technical usage. So what is parousia? Parousia is the coming of the king. That's a royal dignitary. So when apontesis is used with parousia, the parousia of Christ, that is without any doubt and without any question and without any controversy, it's a technical usage. So what does that mean? Well, it means that when Paul uses apontesis along with parousia in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 to 17, He's using them in a technical sense. And that demands that he was saying, <clears throat> the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the angel. Then we which are alive and remain shall meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. Well, it doesn't mean we're going to be with him in the air per se, but we'd all be, always be with him. Where was he coming? He was coming to dwell with man, just like Revelation chapter 21, 1 to 3 says, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw a new Jerusalem as a bride adorned for her husband, descending from God out of heaven, and a voice saying, the tabernacle of God is with man, or is man. He's on earth. And so when you put all these forces together and these facts together, it becomes abundantly clear that Paul is, in fact, using apontesis and parousia in that technical sense, demanding Christ was coming to earth. And I like to say when it says uh, we shall meet him in the air, that's the spiritual realm. And, the, and I developed this, by the way, in my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding uh, of the King of Kings. The idea of Christ meeting in the air is a way of him saying that he was defeating the, the, the God of this world, the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. Or as Paul would express it in Ephesians chapter 2, the God of the air. Hmm. Air, same Greek word. And so, I mean, this is really powerful to me. Let me read, and I sure hope I can get back here to my screen without blowing myself up here. Uh, let me read a little bit. From my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, page 142 and following. <clears throat> the the Balls and Schneider, uh, Exegetical Dictionary of the New Testament, they acknowledge that apontesis has a technical use. And, and by the way, I, I've got to say this. When you read some of the commentators, it is almost as if you can detect that they see this hydrogen bomb that is about to go off in the midst of presuppositional theology. And so they kind of hedge, they kind of dodge, they, they kind of equivocate. So Balsh and Snyder says, uh, whether this technical definition, and they acknowledge that it had a def technical definition, they say, uh, whether this technical definition should be applied to the Thessalonians should be, quote, left to the exegesis of the respective context, unquote. Well, that sounds good. I, I agree that er every context is the final determinative factor uh, in the definition of a word, term, or phrase. Well, here's the problem. 
Apontesis is being used with parousia, and the lexicons, the commentators, virtually all agree that when used together, you have to take it in its technical sense. Now, it's really interesting that Bullinger's critical lexicon says of Apontesis, quote, to come or go from a place towards a person and so meet face to face from opposite directions, especially to meet and come back with the person who has been met. Now, <clears throat> there was a scholar by the name of Peterson. He is sometimes, I, I, I said it was Plev, Plevnik. Plevnik, and, uh, Plevnik followed Peter, Peterson, but Peterson is often cited as the originator of the idea of the technical use of apontesis. And then, and yet, Bollinger, date wise, actually preceded Peterson. Anyway, all that is said, all that aside. And Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament uh, Greek says, quote, the word is to be understood as a technical term for a civic custom of antiquity, whereby a public welcome was accorded to by a city to important visitors, unquote. And this is one of those examples in which Kittles, they do not develop the go and meet and escort back concept. They just go, go out to meet. And the same thing with Lowe and Nida, Liddell and Scott, Moulton and Milligan uh, say, the word seems to have been a kind of a technical term for the official visit of a newly arrived dignitary. Well, if you follow that language carefully enough, you know that they're agreed, agreeing with the concept of going out to meet, coming back to earth. And so they add, quote, this connotation points toward our rising to meet Christ in order to escort him immediately back to earth. And Vines, New Testament Dictionary, says, Quote, Apontesis is, to be, is used in the papyri of a newly arriving magistrate. It seems that the special idea of the word was the official welcoming of a newly arrived dignitary. In other words, they recognize the technical sense of it. And so, hey, look at there. I got managed to come back. <clears throat> now, that is in, that's in the lexicons. And in the lexicons, what you have is you have the lexicographers, like Thayer's, for instance. Thayer's just gives a little bitty T9 C definition, and they leave it at that. Thayer's is one of those. And of course, you have to understand, Thayer was a premillennialist. And <clears throat> as a premillennialist, he ascribed, at least to my knowledge, to the rapture doctrine. Well, the rapture doctrine and apontesis don't get along well at no, all. No. And so it could very well be that Thayer saw the definition of apontesis and said, well, it, me, it means to meet. Okay, let's go to another word. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so just from the lexical evidence, folks, and, and what really, really, really gets me about what I'm going to share with you right here. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, what you find is that many of the commentators very clearly see the danger of apontesis. Now, Moulton and Milligan say that apontesis is, quote, the official welcome of a newly arrived dignitary, but suggests that the idea is of Christians leaving the earth, meeting Christ in the air, and then proceeding to heaven. But that's not what it says. <laughs> and that is not what apontesis suggested. So let, let me summarize this again, simply stated, and I'm reading from my book page 141, if we apply the normal technical definition of apontesis to 1 Thessalonians 4.17, it means that the believers were to be caught up, harpazo, to meet Christ, quote, in the air, unquote, and then escort him back to earth to dwell with him forever. Earth is the destination. And as I just pointed out a few moments ago, this agrees with Revelation 21.3 and 10, and the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, God dwelling 
with man, meaning, quote, the tabernacle of God is with man. Now, one commentator, and I have to tell you, I really, really like this commentator. I don't, I don't invariably agree with him, but he, he generally gives you a wealth of additional bibliographic citations for you to do your own research and study. But Edie is his name, E-A-D-I-E. -E. Uh, he wrote uh, six or seven commentators or commentaries. And he says, quote, the Lord is descending to the earth. They, people on earth, are caught up on his progress to meet him. And thus, God brings them with him, unquote. F.F. F. Bruce, although he hesitates to apply the technical use of the word consistently, nonetheless says, when a dignitary paid an official visit, i.e. a parousia, to a city in Hellen Hellenistic times, the, re the action of the leading citizens of going out to meet him and escort, escort him back on the final stage of his journey was called the apontesis. N.T. Wright says <clears throat> that the language of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, quote, evokes the scene familiar from much Hellenistic and Roman writing of a king or emperor paying a, a, a state visit to a city or province. As he approaches, the citizens come out to meet him at some distance from the city, not in order then to hold a meeting out in the countryside, but to escort him into the city. Meeting the Lord in the air is not a way of saying, in order then to stay safely away from this wicked world, it is the prelude to the implied triumphant return to earth where the Messiah will reign and his people with him as Lord, Savior, and Judge. And in that context, parousia means what it means in imperial rhetoric. In other words, as a technical term. And so Wright continues, it, in that context, parousia means what it means in imperial rhetoric, the royal presence of the true Lord, our emperor. That's in his book entitled Paul, page 55. Now, again, the point, of course, and again, reading from page 145 now, the point, of course, is that if we allow apontesis to have its normal technical definition of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, the passage teaches precisely the opposite of most futures paradigms. As Waldron notes, pre-tribulationists assume that uh, that statement, i.e., meet the Lord in the air, implies that after this meeting, Christ and the church return together to heaven. Actually, this is neither stated nor implied. In fact, the word in the original, i.e., apontesis, implies exactly the opposite. And I'll close with this comment from Andrew Perriman. <coughs> Pardon me. Andrew Perriman says, quote, that apontesis is characteristically used with reference to what happens when people, people go out from a city or, or town to meet someone who is approaching. Luke describes how believers in Rome came out of the city as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet Ice Apontesis, Paul's party, Acts 28, 15. The parousia of Christ in the Roman world then was Christ coming to play part in people's lives that the emperor and imperial cult would otherwise have played? The parousia of the Son of Man supersedes the parousia of man of lawlessness. You see what he's doing here? Paul is playing on the parousia of the man of sin versus the parousia of Christ. This language, Perriman says, is a direct challenge to the prevailing theology. It both mimics and subverts. <clears throat> and if we disconnect the prophecy from its political context, we render it vacuous. And that's in his book, The Coming of the Son of Man. Now, just think about what Andrew Perriman is saying there, ladies and gentlemen. Andrew Perriman, in, in one of the most foundational New Testament texts of all. I mean, everyone goes to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to talk about a yet future end of time coming of the Lord, right? And yet, here's Andrew Perriman, 
an incredibly famous scholar of the day, says, hmm, if we allow the meaning of apontesis and parousia to stand in its historical context, <clears throat> it has absolutely nothing to do with a rapture off of the earth, but of Christ coming to earth to dwell with man. So I'm going to stop right there, uh, Daniel, and let you carry on. Oh, yeah. Offer, <laughs> all, all, offer your thoughts. I've, you know, I, I've kind of talked here for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I enjoyed it. Uh, that last quote, especially, that was good. I'll have to get the name of that book from you again. I read your book several years ago, but I, you know, not be bad of me, but I just don't remember every single quote in it. So. <laughs> I don't either. That's why I read them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, so I think, I, uh, first, I want to point out one commentary I had. Um, I really like the, the Anchor Yell Bible commentary. The what now? Yeah, uh, the, <coughs> the uh, it's, it's in my computer as the AYCB. I thought it was the Anchor Yell Bible commentary. Oh, yeah, yeah, Anchor Bible College, yeah, uh, Anchor go. Bible Commentary Series. They're, they're all fed very, very good. Oh, and so in, uh, in their comments on to meet the Lord in the air, they go through basically what you just talked about, and they say in the technical sense, this word is used of citizens, a group of them going out to a city to meet a visiting dignitary, so on and so forth. And they give about one, two, two or three, two or three paragraphs or so of, <laughs> of information from early church fathers, Josephus, and all this about what this word meet actually means. Then at the very, very end they say, but it's impossible to, uh, to prove this one way or the other, you know, that basically... I may have that quote because I know that in my book, oh, yeah. uh, I, I have a quotation from some commentary. And like I said, I don't remember all of them either, oh, but yeah. I, yeah. I remember that I just gathered so many, uh, so many different quotes. Uh, but one of the, one of the quotes that I have in the book is they document the meaning. They document that apontesis, you got to go out, you, you join their entourage, you come back to the city because the city is the def destination and they do a great job of documenting. And then they say, oh, but that can't be true. Yeah, that's exactly what he says. He says, uh, <laughs> but it is improbable nevertheless on the number of accounts. And a lot of what he says after that is, you know, there's some arguments from the text, but a lot of it seems to be presupposition. You know, it doesn't say anything about escorting anyone or anything like that, even though after they cite all these scholars saying it was going to happen. But uh, there is an interesting thing that they point out, and that is not this language specifically, but that this... Um, scene of meeting the Lord, the, the people of God meeting the Lord, comes from an Old Testament story, Exodus chapter 19. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says that the people had been called by God. Uh, and I, let me, I'll get the exact verse reference there for you. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. And he talks a lot in this first chapter about uh, the Holy Spirit, how they did not, the gospel did not come in just word, but it also came in power. And he even goes on to say that you have forsaken uh, your idols. Uh, in uh, verse 9, you've turned from your idols to serve a living and true God, and now you wait for the Son from heaven. That's the story of the Exodus. They were chosen, they were called by God, <laughs> brought out by the Spirit of God in great, not just word, but also in power and might and deed. And they had turned from their idols to, to serve a living God. And now here they are at the base of Mount Sinai, um, waiting on the Lord from heaven. And then as you move through 1 Thessalonians and even 2 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 talks about how they were being sanctified by the Spirit. So they needed to keep themselves pure. 1 Thessalonians 5 says that he wanted their, their soul, their spirit, and their body to be preserved. And it was not you singular, but you plural, your soul, spirit, and body to be preserved as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, to keep themselves spotless and blameless and sanctified for that wedding ceremony. And then in 2 Thessalonians 2, he talks again how they were being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So when you come to, Acts, uh, to Exodus chapter 19, and you start reading in verse 10, the Lord tells Moses to get the people 
to sanctify them, to consecrate them. Let them wash their garments. They need to be holy, uh, spotless. They need to be purified. And then on the third day that the Lord is going to, to come down to Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, <laughs> by the way, uh, every eye will see him, right? And yeah. then he begins to say, the beasts, the animals, they can't come and touch the mountain. You don't get too close. There's going to be uh, smoke and fire and all this, which is the scene that the Hebrews writer paints in Hebrews chapter 12, 18 and following, which is drawing off of this same account. And the commentators of the Anchorial Bible Commentary point out how, in all likelihood, this is the source passage for meeting the Lord in, for, for meeting the Lord in the air of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. So then what happens is, on the third day, uh, by the way, he says to the people, be ready on the third day, do not go near a woman. <laughs> Which, you know, <laughs> some days that might be good advice in general. Uh, depending no on, depending no on how comment. much trouble. No, no. Look, look, move right along. <laughs> I've, been in, I've been in big trouble recently. So I understand <laughs> how this is. This is not from a place of I'm better. You know, she's worse. This is a point, and I am but a worm, and I've made <laughs> terrible mistakes <laughs> and not done things I should have done. Anyways, but that is echoed by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 3 where he talks about keeping the vessel pure and all these sorts of things, it, which is a, it's, it's really strange because you go from this discussion of persecution and waiting on the coming of the Lord and waiting on, waiting on uh, the vengeance from God to keep yourself sexually pure, which is a really strange, strange shift. But if Paul is drawing from the Exodus account in Exodus 19, which I believe he is, then it makes perfect sense. And it's not talking about individual sexual purity, but corporate purity from idolatry as the bride of Christ, as she sanctifies herself, waiting on her husband. So in Exodus 19, after all of this happens, the scripture says in verse 17, and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. Now it's not the word uh, ampantesis, but it is a conjugate of the word uh, as it's used elsewhere in the New Testament. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire which reminds me a lot of Revelation 11. Mm -hmm. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. And when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. Then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and he called Moses, and Moses went up. <laughs> okay, great picture here. So we have in Hebrews chapter 12, 18 and following, You've not come to a mountain that can be touched to blood and fire and vapor and smoke, you know, all these, rather to, uh, to fire and to smoke and earthquakes and all this. You've come to the New Jerusalem. You've come to Mount uh, Zion. You've come to an innumerable company of angels, to the church of the firstborn, to the Son, to the Father. You've come to the very presence of God. And now all that was left was for them to just go up. So it's a beautiful correlation here between 1 Thessalonians 4, which draws off this passage in the Old Testament in which they met God at Mount Sinai. And now in Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 18 and following, it's about meeting God once more on Mount Zion. And this is just, when I started reading through this passage, all the parallels just began popping out one after the other. And to me, it's, it's wonderful evidence, but it also is evidence of not just a preterist eschatology, but a covenantal eschatology. That is, this was about a giving of the Old Covenant, and this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 is about the consummation, not the taking away, of the New Covenant. So there's so much rich, uh, uh, there's so much rich detail here that could probably be fleshed out over another couple of episodes. But I'll leave it there for your comments, Don. Well, <clears throat> that that's really some amazing stuff. And those are some connections I, quite frankly, I'd never seen with Exodus chapter 19. Now, I realized, and I've, I've taught this for many, many years, not in great detail, but nonetheless, uh, there's no question that Exodus chapter 19 is a marital context. Uh, the, the Hebrew scholars have recognized this for forever. They call that the time of the Kedushin. 
uh, you know, the, the, the marriage tent and the, as you <coughs> pointed out, the sanctification that was to take place. So I've recognized some elements of that, but uh, insofar as a point by point delineation, as you pointed it out there, I, I'd never traced all of that. So that's, <laughs> well, and, and look, it's just another fantastic example uh, of how powerfully the Exodus from Israel's history is echoed in the New Testament in the second final Exodus. You know, the, the ancient rabbis used to say, as it was in the days of Moses, Moses so, so shall it be in the days of Messiah. Uh, as it was in the first Exodus, so shall it be in the second. And they gleaned from Isaiah chapter 11, specifically Isaiah 43 and a host of other uh, Old Testament prophecies, they knew that in the end time, there was to be another Exodus. Uh, Micah chapter 7, verse 15, a very intriguing oh, yeah. uh, passage. Uh, According to the day, number of the days of the coming out of the land of Egypt, so I will show wonders uh, in the land. There's some translational issues there, and it, and it may not be according to the number of the of the days. Instead, it may simply be as it was in the days of coming out. Well, it was still 40 years, either way you want to look at it. Uh, but one translation is a little more explicit than the other. But nonetheless, here are all these Old Testament prophecies that pointed to the last days in which God would dwell with man in a new tabernacle. Because let, let's make no mistake, Hebrews makes it abundantly clear that first tabernacle and that first temple, they were typological. Right. They, point, they pointed to the ultimate tabernacle of God and God dwelling with men. You know, over and over and over, Exodus chapter 25 through 40, God said over and over, you build this tabernacle. I will dwell with you there. I will meet you there. And, and so you have all of this imagery of tabernacle, of temple, being where God would do, dwell with his people, and you have the first exodus in establishing that tabernacle, then you bring that and segue into the Solomonic temple, and you have all of that incredible imagery that is brought out. And in the New Testament, you have this second exodus, and as you so wonderfully went through those constituent elements there and laid, laid them out for us, that takes us right back in a very powerful way to the to the beginning of the Exodus. And so when the New Testament writers employ that very image, and you know, Colossians, by the way, Colossians is another book that in your quote normal commentary, you don't see hardly any reference to the Exodus. But when you look at the critical commentaries, you look at them when they go into the language, the linguistics, doing these comparative studies between the Septuagint uh, and, and the books dealing with the Exodus and how Paul draws on those very same identical Greek words in the book of Colossians. And not only, not only for the Exodus, but also for the Garden of Eden as well. Uh, Colossians 1, 5, and 7 is just a real quick example that I'll throw out there for everyone to consider. You know, God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, be, be, be fruitful and multiply. Well, here in Colossians chapter one, Paul's talking about the church being the, this creation of Christ. And he says that the gospel had been preached in all the world and it was bringing forth fruit in all of the world. And many, many, many commentators have noticed this second creation, this new creation motif found there in the book of Colossians. But again, back to the imagery of, of the Messianic temple and Exodus chapter 19 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 all the way through chapter 5, really. Uh, that's, that's some just absolutely gorgeous stuff. Yeah. And <clears throat> I, know, I know Dallas and I have talked about this an awful lot uh, of how and I've said this about a gazillion times, the more I study, the more convinced, uh, the more I realize how ignorant I am. And that really is true. And the very first time I ever heard that statement, it was made by an elder from the East Bay Church of Christ in, uh, in Shawnee, Oklahoma. 
at 86 years old, I think I've told this story, but it's worth repeating. At 86 years old, he taught himself the Greek. He could sight read the Greek, having taught himself how to, how to know, understand, and read the Greek. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I am so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, I mean, and he just absolutely loved to do that. And that's how I feel uh, as I increasingly delve into, for instance, Israel's feast days. The more that I study that motif, uh, and the same thing with the Messianic temple, you start seeing the tendrils, if I may use that term, of that doctrine, of that theology, just going everywhere, being referenced everywhere. Uh, I love Richard Hayes's terminology, the echoes of scripture because that terminology is so very, very appropriate. And it just demonstrates how far removed we moderns really are. And, and we might even point the special accusing finger at members of the churches of Christ who have been taught, you don't need to study the Old Testament. That was nailed to the cross. I followed that little mantra for years, repeated it for years, until I discovered how horribly wrong I was. Well, I had a situation just recently. Um, I put a, a little blurb out on our on our church's Facebook page about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and I got just blasted by some guys in our area uh, because oh. of that. And uh, I just commented on the fact that Jesus was was uh, dealing with a debate between two schools of thought among the rabbis about the any, ca any cause divorce versus fornication only, the interpretation of the word uh, uncleanliness or nakedness in Deuteronomy 24. <laughs> so when I said all that, they said, well, that's your problem is you're just dealing too much in the Old Testament. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus, if, if you believe that Jesus was just properly interpreting the Old Testament, then why should we even love our neighbor as ourselves? like Jesus told us to, the golden rule, you know? And I'm going, man, I sometimes, Don, I don't know if you do this or not, but you think, surely that's not what I believed. Like, surely I didn't have such a disdain for the Old Testament. And then you run into somebody <laughs> and you go, okay, never mind, that's how it was. <laughs> that, that was me, yes, I'm that, not, that was me. <laughs> I'm not as crazy I thought, as, I, as I thought I was, thank you. <laughs> but uh, just the... Not even being willing to entertain the, going back to the Old Testament to see the context of what Jesus was talking about just shows. Oh, it's it's you. You almost get sad because here's so much cool stuff that they can go see, but they just yeah. they just don't want to go back past Matthew. It's it's a shame. There's a scholar by the name of Sherwin White. Uh, I've forgotten the full name at the moment, but this particular scholar uh, wrote a monograph on marriage, divorce, and remarriage through Old Covenant eyes. And one of the things that this scholar points out that once you start examining so many of the doctrines that we've argued and thought over and what have you, uh, kind of like you were saying there, uh, <clears throat> if we don't understand the Old Testament context of them, then we put a modern slant on them that was never in the mind of the ancient writers and the ancient the, the pharisees and the sadducees uh the school of, of hillel and shammai that you were referencing there right. a, few, a few moments ago uh had they said if they would set in on some of the church of christ spats over marriage and divorce they would go what <clears throat> especially when you realize that one party accepted the other party's certificate of divorce you know, <laughs> it wasn't like they said, no, this is unscriptural. They said, okay, well, yep, that is a divorce. We don't agree with how you went about it, but a divorce is a divorce. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, there's so much about it. But yeah. anyway, uh, Sherwin White makes the observation, uh, and I've hinted at it here. They say so much of modern controversy over marriage, divorce, and remarriage is simply anachronistic. The ancients knew no such controversies right. as it is formed in modern theological circles. And 
I, I mean, it, without any doubt whatsoever, they argued and they spat, and, you know, they fought about, about it. But as you point out, they both said, oh, divorce is divorce. Okay, it's it's done. Yeah. Right. So that that in one way you're going, well, if you both agree that it's a divorce is a divorce and you move on and you what have you, uh, then why fight about it? Yeah. But but nonetheless, they did. Because it's fun. Because it's yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh <laughs> Uh, there was a story, Don, about these two guys who were training to be rabbis, and they fought about this one passage. They just fought and fought and fought all through school, and they ended up being appointed to synagogues in diff two different towns pretty close to each other, and they met every Thursday for lunch and just fought about this one passage. And finally, they were getting all up in, on up in the ears, and God told the angels, he said, look, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm going <laughs> down there, and I'm telling them what this passage means right from the source. <laughs> and he goes, and he stands before them, and he says, fellas... I'm God. I'm the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And I'm here to I'm come here to tell you what this passage means. They said, "Don't you do it? We almost got it figured out." <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I I think that people would just as soon fight as they had to have the answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but one thing that people don't realize about that is, what did they do when they came back from Babylonian captivity? They were told to divorce their Gentile spouses. Now, had Jesus been given a universal declaration for divorce, uh, he would have been contradicting several Old Testament passages, but he was answering a specific question about a specific passage. Anyways, that's not what two guys in the Bible is about, but we ended up there. So. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we we can take a side trip every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, back, back to this Alphontesis, I hope everyone can begin to see the incredible significance. I mean, uh, I state in my book, that if we accept the technical definition of apontesis, it literally is an atomic bomb going off in the theological world. And as I pointed out a few moments ago, there, there are some scholars and some commentators, they say, well, there's no doubt about what the true definition of apontesis, even when used with parousia, is. No, no question about it. But it can't be true. It can't be true, we are told. Well, why can't it be true? Uh, well, because that's not what my church teaches. And so what happens is the interpretation, the, the, the traditional interpretation of, this, of the definition and the nature of the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the judgment and resurrection, is superimposed onto apontesis, and a host of other words we might point out. We're we're just focused on one, but that traditional theology is superimposed on the true definition, and the traditional interpretation says, "I will not allow that technical definition, which was universally accepted in the ancient Greek world, among Greeks, among Romans, and among the Jews. I'm not going to allow that to stand because if it stands, my whole theology." My entire theology goes up in smoke. I can't have that. And that's what happens. Uh, <clears throat> I, I can't tell you the number of individuals, Daniel, that when I have shared the definition of apontesis, I, I have had people get angry, hmm. absolutely, totally angry. And they've said, that can't be true. And I say, well, why can't it be true? Well, because that's not what my preacher teaches. Well, okay. Um, I think your preacher needs to take another look. And I've had people just storm off, literally just storm off. Or if it's on the internet, well, you're just a false teacher and a her heretic, click, gone, you know, yeah. that type of thing. Uh, a lot of people seem to take a, a kind of a morbid pleasure of calling you a heretic and then clicking off. <laughs> I, I call them hit and run the posters yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> because there's, that's exactly what they do. And, and so this is such a rich, rich study. And, and look, folks, we, have, we barely touched the hem of the garment. How much time do we have here? Oh, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just make this observation. Josephus uses apontesis in his technical sense. The Roman writers used apontesis and parousia 
in the technical sense. If you want the documentation of what Apontesis and Parousia meant in the first century, in the context of 1 Thessalonians 4, let me urge you to get a copy of my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings. Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. If you order the book, send me a note that says you saw the offer here on Two Guys in a Bible, and I'll refund your shipping, and that'll save you $5. I believe that takes up 30 seconds. Yes. So, folks, thanks for joining us here on Tuesday evening on Two Guys in a Bible, a voice you can trust. With that, I'm saying good night and God bless. Daniel, you want to close on out? All right, sure. I'll close on out with one more thing. The technical term, uh, the Anchor Yale Bible Commentary says, was so well known that some of the uh, ancient scholars, Latin scholars, wouldn't even translate the term into Latin. They would just keep it in the Greek form. There you go. Have a good night and God bless. Amen.